Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, uh, for today's presentation, which is Food for Thought, Legal Compliance for Food Businesses. And in this presentation today, we will be, we will be reviewing the top considerations for keeping a food business in compliance with the law. And that could be for an existing food business or if you're starting a new food business, um, this could be pertinent to you. Now, um, I'd like to introduce myself first. My name is Mary Cogut Lowell. I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Service of Collier County. And my co-presenter today will be supervising attorney Wendy Wilson from Legal Aid of Broward County. And we'd also like to acknowledge um, one of our colleagues, Daniela from Legal Services of Greater Miami, who was also very instrumental in preparing this program. Now, before we jump into the meat of the program, we'd like to talk about the free services that are available um, through the Community Economic Development Unit at Legal Aid Service. And there are a couple of different programs that we'd like to let you be aware of so that if you think that you, that you or your business might be eligible, you can contact us for more information. The first project I'd like to mention is the Small Business Legal Representation and COVID-19 Relief and Recovery Project. Now in this program, Legal Aid Service of Collier County pro provides free legal services to eligible Collier County small businesses and nonprofits. Now to be eligible for this program, the business or nonprofit must create or save low income jobs, which are defined as up to 50% of area median income as determined by the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, that have been impacted by the pandemic and that face legal barriers. In addition to free legal services, free tax assistance may be provided. So that's a, an overview of the requirements for a business or nonprofit to qualify for the SBLR project. Again, we will encourage you to contact us if you think your business may be eligible or if you want more information, I will give you contact information later on in this presentation. So that's one of two um, projects through which legal, free legal services are presented in our community economic development. The other project is called the Florida Community Development Legal Project. And that's a statewide project. On the slide here, you can see the names of six different legal aid organizations throughout the state of Florida who are participating in this Florida Community Development Legal Project. And um, eligible businesses and nonprofits can be um, from anywhere in the state of Florida. And our project attorneys have extensive knowledge in all kinds of legal issues affecting nonprofits and businesses. And, and also we're also very knowledgeable about uh, affordable housing development. So um, again, please feel free to contact us if you're interested in more information or applying for services. And finally, before we jump into the presentation today, we just would like to remind everyone that we're not providing legal services or legal advice through this training. This is for informational and educational purposes only, and you should seek legal counsel and independent tax advice regarding any topics discussed in today's training. So the training does not create any kind of attorney-client relationship between the attorneys and participants. And if you have specific questions relating to your business or nonprofit, you're encouraged to consult with um, legal counsel. And again, feel free to apply for legal services if you think that your business may fall with, uh, may be eligible under either of the two projects that I mentioned earlier. And also one final note, due to time constraints, this presentation is general and covers only the most common legal requirements relevant to the food businesses. So for specific questions, please please feel free to contact us later or consult with an attorney of your choice. <clears throat> so now let's talk about regulation of food businesses. And it's important to know that food businesses are regulated under 
federal, state, and local laws. So it's important for you as an operator of a food business to be aware of what these legal requirements are. And all business owners should develop and maintain a compliance program to obtain and keep all the required licenses and permits in good standing. Failing to do so can, have, can definitely have negative uh, consequences for your business. So we do encourage every food service business to have some sort of a uh, compliance program. Now let's talk about the key steps in informing and operating a food service business in Florida. First, you will have to decide how you would like to structure your business. And that could range from anything from the most simple structure, which is a sole proprietorship, to some sort of entity formation. Many, for example, many food service businesses are operated as corporations or LLCs. So the first thing you need to do is decide what is the best structure for your business. And that's something that you can consult with an attorney about. And then once you figure out what kind of structure you'd like to have for your business, then you need to make sure that you have any required business licenses and permits and get everything in place so that you've, you've gotten everything, you've, sat, you've satisfied all federal, state, and local requirements. And then of course, the, the, the final step is compliance. You want to make sure you maintain compliance with the law through, well, throughout um, the time that you're operating that business. And so again, that's why we do encourage all food service businesses to have a compliance program. Let's talk a little bit more about business formation. Generally, all businesses operating in Florida must register to transact business in the state and must register for a tax uh, sales tax account if uh, selling goods to the public. Businesses that are corporation formed as a corporation, a nonprofit, limited liability, and certain partnerships actually have to be registered with the state and the particular um, agency that the, the, the agency report that's important for you to contact for that is the Florida Division of Corporation, which is in the Secretary of State's office. And on our slide here, we have a link to instructions and application forms for filing with the Florida Division of Corporations. They do have a very good website. And again, you can always consult with an attorney if you're not sure what is the best business structure for your business. As I mentioned previously, there's a simple structure called a sole proprietorship, which does not have to be registered with the division of corporations in order to form the business. However, the owner of a sole proprietorship must operate the sole proprietorship in his or her own personal name. Or if you don't, if you don't want to, and you want to use a different name, then, then um, the sole proprietor will have to register that fictitious name with the Florida Division of Corporations. And let's talk a little bit more about registration of fictitious names. Again, if a sole proprietor doesn't want his or her personal name to serve as the business name, the owner, or if let's say you form an, uh, a corporation or LLC, but you want to operate the business in a name that's different from the official legal name of the corporation or LLC, then it's necessary to register what's called a fictitious name with the Florida Division of Corporations. And you may have heard the, um, the initials DBA before, meaning doing business as, some people may call a fictitious name a, a doing business name. So you have a corporation or you have an LLC that's doing business as a particular name. That's, that's, that's what we refer to as a fictitious name. Now, there are some requirements for that. It has to, you can register, you can provide a business with a name that's different from your personal name, uh, but it must not be misleading or misrepresent the nature of the business. So for example, be careful with claims such as miracle cure foods, because such names could lead to some sort of liability possibly in the future. Um, but the, the important thing to know is that if you're operating a small business, um, other than your personal name, if you're a, 
uh, the sole proprietor or other than the official legal name of a corporation or uh, LLC, and you want to, uh, you, if you're using a different name, it has to be registered with the state. That doesn't actually give you, you know, you, you register the name in order to notify the state and the general public about the use of that name, but it, it doesn't give you the same rights to a name as does registering a business in a particular name. For more information, again, you can always feel free to reach out to us and we'll provide any other information you may be interested in. Now, all businesses, including home businesses, that sell project products in Florida must, must register for a tax identification number with the Florida Department of Revenue. Um, many businesses are responsible for sales and use tax, um, and if you have an employees, you, the business may also be responsible for unemployment tax. And depending how the business is structured, if it's a regular, what, they, what the IRS refer, refers to as a C corporation, then you might be, your business may have to pay a corporate income tax in the state of Florida. So all of that depends on how the business is structured. Um, and you are, can definitely visit the Florida Department of Revenue website for general information and for registration forms. And we've provided a link to the Florida Department of Revenue website. So, so far we've talked about a couple of state agencies that you may or may not be involved in. One is the Florida Division of Corporations, which is in the Secretary of State's office. Um, you also will have some interaction with the Florida Department of Revenue for, for tax purposes. But we don't, we don't end there. Um, there are also state licenses that will be required for your food business, depending on what kind of food business you're operating. So you might want to ask yourself these questions. What kind of food business are you operating? What type of food are you selling? Are you preparing the food? Is it prepackaged? Where are you preparing the foods? Are you serving customers in the same place where the food is prepared? Or maybe are you moving to a different or a new commercial space? These are all, these are all questions that will um, may come into play when you're determining what state agencies you will have to interact with. And basically, there are three state agencies regulating food establishments in the state of Florida. One is the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, also known as DBPR. And the, the, the um, DBPR re does regulate public food service establishments, restaurants, mobile, mobile food dispensing vehicles, theme park food services, and also alcoholic beverages and tobacco. The second agency is the Florida Department of, of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And that particular agency is responsible for regulating wholesalers and food retailers groceries and convenience stores, food manufacturing or processing plants, and you see some other, some other groups that are listed on the slide here, food warehouses, bakeries, fish and meat markets. These all come under the purview of the Florida Department of Agriculture and, and um, Consumer Services. And then the third agency that regulates food establishments in the state of Florida is the Florida Department of Health. And the Florida Department of Health register, re regulates drink only bars and um, food services in nursing homes, hospitals, schools, correction and, descent, uh, and detention facilities, adult daycare centers, et cetera. And let's talk a little bit more about DBPR because actually there are a couple of divisions within DP, DBPR that operate different food service uh, businesses. The Division of Hotels and Restaurants licenses and inspects and regulates public, public lodging and food service establishments in Florida. And then there's a separate division called the Division of Alcoholic Beverages and Tobacco, which regulates the manufacturing, distribution, sale, and service of alcoholic beverages and tobacco products in Florida. So again, depending on what the nature of your business is, um, what sort of food you, you are serving, how it's packaged, how it's prepared, those are, that will determine which state agency you're, um, will be responsible for regulating your business. 
DBPR does um, issue food licenses for the food uh, businesses listed on this slide. And as you can see, there are quite a few of them. Everything from permanent food service seating, permanent food service non-seating, and we'll speak a little bit more about those terms, catering, mobile food dispensing, vending machines, theme park carts, um, culinary educational programs and temporary food service events. So CDPPR does cover a wide range and issue licenses for a fairly broad range of businesses. Now, what is a public food service establishment? That phrase refers to any building, vehicle, place or structure uh, where food is prepared, served, sold for immediate consumption on the vicinity of the premises, called for or taken out by customers or prepared prior to, be, prior to being delivered to another location for, for consumption. So that is what is meant in Florida by a public food service establishment. <clears throat> and also be aware, Florida law requires owners of new public food service and new owners of existing establishments to get a license from the division before operating. So again, if you're starting a new food service, you need to get a license. If you are taking over an existing food service business from, from someone, someone else or another business that was, already, that was already licensed, then you need to get a new license. In addition, plan review is required when an establishment is newly built converted from another use, extensively modeled, or reopened after being closed for at least one year. So DPPR, when, when in these events, will um, we'll need to review um, the plan, the, you know, how your business is laid out in, physically in the establishment. And then again, here I mentioned previously, DPPR licenses permanent food services, both seating and non-seating. Seating refers to a restaurants with seats, with actual seats for dining in. And a permanent food service license are sometimes referred to as food service licenses as they generally are, it generally refers to a structure with walls, floor and ceiling that's permanently fixed to the ground. Now a non-seating permanent food service refers to a restaurant that offers takeout or delivery, but doesn't actually have seats for customers to dine in. Both of those are regulated through DBPR. Uh, DBPR also licenses catering services. Now catering service is a food service that only provides catering services and nothing else. Any public food service establishments that's licensed by DPR may also provide catering services without getting a separate catering license. So if you already hold um, another license, you don't have to have a separate one if you're also providing catering services. And DBPR uh, licenses mobile food dispensing vehicles or hot dog carts. And that refers to a food truck or hot dog cart where food is actually prepared or served. So, wow, that's a lot. DBPR is responsible for quite a few food, food services in Florida, but not all of them. And here's where the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services come in, comes in. The uh, Department of Agriculture generally regulates wholesale food operations, convenience stores, grocery stores, food processing operations, food storage warehouse operations, and non-alcoholic beverage operations. So here's a list of, regulate, of establishments that are regulated by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. So you'll see it's different from the establishments we talked about with respect to DPPR. And here we're talking about supermarkets, grocery stores, convenience stores, coffee shops, bakeries, et cetera. All of those, all of those uh, food service establishments listed on the slide here. And then here are the types of permits issued by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Those would include first a retail permit, permit that would be for establishments selling food items to the general public, 
a retail establishment, then also wholesale or manufactured. Those are issued to bottled water plants, food processing plants, et cetera. Hemp and medical marijuana, any establishment that manufactures, processes, packs, holds, prepares, or sells food that consists of or contains hemp extract intended for human ingestion is required to have a permit issued, permit issued by the Florida Division of Food Safety before operating in Florida. Because the manufacturing, selling, and distribution of food with or without hemp are ex extract are covered under a single permit within the Division of Food Safety. So that pretty much gives you an overview of the different kinds of permits um, uh, issued by the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And now I'll hand over um, the presentation to my colleague, Wendy Wilson. And Wendy, just let me know if you'd like me to advance the slides. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you, Mary. So now we're going to talk a little bit about food trucks, or as their technical name is, mobile food establishments, or MFEs. Um, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services regulates uh, mobile food vendors who sell either prepackaged foods or foods that are not potentially hazardous. So some things like that are foods that are not temperature controlled for safety, such as ice confections, uh, snow cones, coffee, tea, soft drinks, pastry products, popcorn and candies. Um, raw fish products that do not include any processing on site, and then certain fresh squeezed juice products that meet very specific requirements. And here at the bottom of the screen, we have the link for applying for a mobile food permit um, at the Department of Agriculture. Um, next slide, please, Mary. Um, now, if you are selling hot dogs or other foods that require temperature control or that could potentially be hazardous, you know, hamburgers, uh, empanadas, um, what have you, um, those are, you know, uh, full service mobile vendors. You require a mobile food dispensing vehicle license from the Department of Business and Professional Re Regulation, DBPR. Um, now, some of the requirements that they're gonna have for that type of food cart, food truck, are, you know, it has to be a mobile vehicle. Um, you have to have adequate dishwashing washing facilities inside the vehicle. You have to have a hand sink. You have to have proper food storage equipment. You need power and some sort of plumbing system. And you need access to water and sewer hookups. Next slide. Some of the other um, considerations that you're going to have with a food truck or a mobile food establishment, if it's a full service cart, you know, selling hot dogs, hamburgers, you know, potentially hazardous foods that are temperature controlled, you're going to need a plan review, which Mary spoke about, which are required for, um, you know, most food service uh, preparation centers, restaurants, that type of thing. You may need a fire inspection of your vehicle. Um, if your uh, mobile food enterprise is on institutional property that is licensed and regulated by the Florida Department of Health, such as schools, universities, nursing homes, you're gonna need a license from the Department of Health. So if you're gonna go park your food truck at a hospital, then you would also need uh, to contact the Department of Health. Now there are local regulations that also deal with um, mobile food um, vendors. And, and one of those is what are the local regulations regarding your ability to park the food truck at a certain location. You can't just pull up, park somewhere and set up for business. So you're gonna to have to check your local regulations, um, the city or county where you're planning to, to park and, and set up business or offer food. 
Um, your food truck may need to be inspected and reviewed by your local health department to make sure it uh, meets food quality and safety standards. So you would, you know, depending on where your vehicle is located, um, you know, you may need to check with Broward County or Miami-Dade County, call your county, wherever um, the particular location is, Lee County, if you're in the Fort Myers area. Um, and then also depending on the type of food, there may be other legal requirements depending on the type of food that you're selling and processing. Next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about commissary agreements. Now, if your mobile food truck is only selling prepackaged, non potentially hazardous foods, such as cookies, crackers, potato chips, you know, prepackaged, and they don't need temperature control to remain safe, you probably do not need a commissary agreement. But otherwise, if you have, if you're selling anything else, you're going to need a commissary agreement. And what a commissary agreement is, is an agreement with the commissary, which is an approved facility, such as a catering operation, a restaurant, or a grocery store, that's going to provide support services for your mobile food establishment, um, including storage of food and your other supplies. Um, you know, you may not realize it, but, you know, you're going to need to have this commissary agreement if you sell the um, foods that require it to store your, you know, prepackaged napkins and, and uh, utensils, um, your paper towels, you know, that, that type of thing. Now, if you plan to process or prepare food at the commissary, like maybe you're preparing your empanada filling or, um, or preparing your burger patties at the food commissary facility, then you have to get a food permit to do that, to prepare those foods. Now you need to apply for your food permit no more than 14 days prior to your anticipated opening date. Next slide, please, Mary. Um, next, we're gonna talk a little bit about cottage food laws. Um, this is a law, the Florida Cottage Food Law, which allows individuals to sell certain foods that are produced in a home kitchen. And home kitchen is very important, as we'll discuss later. Um, for the cottage food laws to apply, the foods have to have a very low risk of foodborne illness. So foods that require time or temperature controls to prevent the growth of pathogens, um, are not permitted cottage food products. Uh, cottage food products cannot be sold wholesale and they can only be sold in the state of Florida. Uh, the operators must properly package and label all cottage foods, including any samples that are offered for tasting. Also to qualify for the cottage food law, your annual gross sales cannot exceed $250,000. And that went into effect in July of this year. Previously, it was much lower. And now again, um, when the law changed in July of this year, producers can now sell an offer for sale and accept payment over the internet or you know, through a website. Um, but the food has to be delivered um, in person directly to the consumer or to their event venue or via mail. And that, again, is a new change. Before, you couldn't send your products via mail, but now you can. Next slide. So here's a list of acceptable cottage food products. And again, these are foods that have a relatively low risk of foodborne illness. Um, breads, rolls, biscuits, cakes, pastries, cookies, candies, jams and jellies, fruit pies, um, dry herbs and seasonings and mixes, homemade pasta, cereals, granola, honey, coated or uncoated nuts, popcorn, popcorn balls, or vinegars. Next slide, please. 
Prohibited foods are things like salsas, barbecue sauces, ketchups, canned fruits and vegetables, chutneys, uh, flavored oils, hummuses, uh, garlic dips, fish or shellfish products, canned pickled products, raw seed sprouts, and then bakery goods that require any sort of refrigeration, such as um, custard pies, um, or even cakes or cupcakes with buttercream frosting. You can't, those are not proper cottage food products. Um, but if your frosting is made with um, some sort of um, like vegetable oil or lard or shortening, something like that, that is not a dairy product, then you could sell a frosted cake. Eggs and uh, other dairy products, including cottage cheeses, yogurts are not acceptable. Cut fresh food, fruits and vegetables, certain juices, um, fresher dried, <clears throat> excuse me, fresher dried meats, focaccia style breads with vegetables and cheeses, and any processing of acidified foods like pickles. Next slide. So if you have a food product that you wish to sell that qualifies under the cottage food laws, here are some basics for a cottage food business. You can, as I said before, sell your food products on your website by mail order or direct to the consumer in person. And then the products have to be delivered directly to the consumer or their private event. Like you could take it to a, a wedding reception um, or you could take it to, you know, a birthday party at a park, or you can send it by mail. And again, that is new. Your food products cannot be sold wholesale. So you cannot sell your cottage food products to a restaurant. Your foods have to be properly packaged and labeled. You can offer free samples for tasting, but the samples have to be prepackaged. Um, so you're not allowed to, for example, if your cottage food is a, um, you know, fresh baked bread, you can't cut the bread into little slices or little squares right at the event. But before the event, say you're at a farmer's market, you can cut it into squares and you can put it into those little pre those little sample cups. And, and as long as you have a label on it, that is acceptable for your sample. And then a cottage food operation has to comply with all other state and federal tax laws and regulations that may apply. Next slide, please. Now the law does require some very specific labeling requirements for cottage food products. Um, and the, lab the information that has to be contained on the label and it needs to be printed in English is the name and address of the cottage food operation the name of the product, the ingredients in descending order of predominance by weight. So if your product is, is a bread or pastry, in all likelihood, your first ingredient is going to be some type of flour. Um, the net weight or net volume of the cottage food product Allergen information is required by federal labeling requirements and we'll get into that a little bit later. And then if you have any nutritional claim that's made, you need the appropriate nutritional information as specified by federal labeling laws. Again, I'll speak about that in a few minutes. And then you need to have the following statement printed in at least 10 point type in a clearly contrasting color to the background made in a cottage food operation that is not subject to Florida's food safety regulations. Next slide, please. So this is a sample of an appropriate cottage food label. You see, we've got the large contrasting disclaimer. We've got the name of the product, the name and address of where it was prepared. We've got the list of ingredients. And then we've got the allergen information. Um, and again, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about that. And then we've got the net weight of this particular cookie. Next slide. So here's the allergen labeling requirements. These are the major 
allergen food groups. It's not all of them. It's just the major ones that you're required to identify. Um, and this is under federal law. The first is milk. Then you have wheat, eggs, fish, shellfish, peanuts, tree nuts. And then you have to specify which particular tree nut you're using. Is it a walnut? Is it pecans? Is it chestnuts? Is it macadamia nuts, whatever the case may be. And lastly, soybeans. Next slide, please. So here's some frequently asked questions regarding cottage food laws. Um, some of the answers that we've discussed, I'll go through them, but if you go on the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services website, they have pages of these frequently asked questions if you're interested. So I think we've already discussed where you can sell your cottage food products. You know, they can be sold from your residence directly to the consumer, but you can also sell by mail order at farmer markets, flea markets, and roadside stands, assuming that you don't have any other food items in your space that otherwise require a food permit. Um, then can you sell to restaurants? No, we already discussed that because that would be considered wholesale. Now, this is an interesting question. The farmer's market where I want to sell my product says I need a food license, even though I'm a cottage food business. Can they require me to get a license? And the answer to that is yes, because the farmer's market is an event that can have its own separate regulations. So even though you do qualify as a cottage food business because you're selling uh, chocolate chip cookies or other cookies that qualify, if the farmer's market you want to go to um, in the particular location requires a food license, then if you want to participate in that farmer's market, you need to get the license. Um, another interesting question is I lease space in a retail building where I operate a small antique shop or, you know, just take that to mean any other retail or office type building. Can I sell my cottage food? Uh, items there? And the answer to that would be no. They can only be sold from your home or a flea market, a roadside stand, that type of thing. So if you've got a small clothing shop or an antique shop or what have you, you can also not sell, you cannot sell your cookies there. Um, can the local government regulate my cottage food business? The state regulates what is an appropriate cottage food business and how it's operated, but there can be local requirements for such things as parking, traffic, or hours of retail operation. Your neighborhood or your city may say that, you know, you can't have more than a certain number of cars parked outside your home, or um, you can't operate a business, any type of business that generates a lot of traffic. So those are the types of things that the local government can regulate, but they can't tell you what kind of food would qualify as a cottage food business. Next slide. Um, here's some more of the uh, frequently asked questions. Can I prepare cottage foods in a rented kitchen or in my motorhome? And the answer to that is no. As I mentioned earlier, it has to be from your home, from your home kitchen. So just the fact that you own a motorhome, you can't cook it and cook at the motorhome and just sell out of your motorhome. Can I use hemp in my cottage food products? No, absolutely not. Um, anything um, containing any other compound from the hemp plant, whether it's CBD or THC, that has to be processed in a regulated food facilities. And then I believe I had mentioned before about can I use frostings and icings made from cream cheese or buttercream, you know, with real butter. And the answer to that is no, um, because these require refrigeration and could be potentially hazardous if they sit out for any period of time. But margarines, vegetable oils, shortenings, vegan butters and margarines, um, those types of things, if you make your frostings with those, that's acceptable. Can I sell honey? Yes, you can sell honey, but only if it's 
honey, that you have um, harvested yourself and labeled yourself. So you don't necessarily have to own the hives yourself, but you have to have harvested it from the hives yourself. So you cannot buy honey in bulk and repackage it and sell it as a cottage food. But if you go to a beekeeper's establishment and you are capable of doing this, but you somehow manage to harvest the honey, then yes, you can sell that as a cottage food. Next slide, please. Um, one caveat with honey is that honey is not a required allergen that needs disclosure, but keep in mind there is a botulism risk for infants. So beekeepers or people selling um, honey and other bee-related products should consider displaying on their labels, do not feed to infants less than one year old. Next slide, please. So the FDA, the US Food and Drug Administration is responsible for assuring that food products sold in the US are safe and properly labeled. So food labeling is required for most prepared foods, such as bread, cereals, canned foods, desserts, drinks, et cetera. Um, nutritional labeling for raw produce, produce, fruits and vegetables and fish is voluntary. Um, the FDA does not pre-approve any labels for food products. Next slide, please. But there are certain exemptions and most of these exemptions would apply, you know, apply to a small business because if you sell fewer than 100,000 units of a product, you are exempt from the labeling requirements. Um, and that's 100,000 units of the product in a 12 month period. However, to qualify for this exemption, you have to annually file a notice with the FDA. Um, next slide, please. So this is a list of all of the food products and you can see it's practically everything, baby foods, alcoholic beverages, cheese, chocolate products, food additives, seafood, dressings, fruits, all of these items, spices, everything requires labeling unless you meet that uh, low volume, you know, under 100,000 units exemption. Next slide. Now I want to talk a little bit about commercial kitchens and co-packing facilities. So if you if your food product or your food business results in you uh, producing sauces, salsas, hummus, cut fruits and vegetables, empanadas, you know, hamburgers, anything like that that's not permitted by the cottage food laws, it's going to need to be prepared in a commercial kitchen um, or commercial packing facility. Now, these are all facilities that are licensed and inspected by the state. So if this is what your business entails, you're gonna enter into a, a contract with one of these facilities and you'll notify the state of Florida of your commissary relationship. Remember back where we were talking about the food trucks and how you need to have a commissary relationship for most types of food trucks, unless you were just selling you know, the pre-packaged cookies and chips. Well, you know, this is, this is what we're referring to as a commissary. Um, one question that you need to keep in mind is what type of insurance is going to be required. The commercial kitchen or the commissary is probably going to require you to maintain a certain level of liability insurance, but some retail establishments where you might sell your food could require an even higher level of insurance. Uh, you know, I understand that, you know, if you are lucky enough to get your product into, say, a Whole Foods, that they have a higher insurance requirement. Um, and again, that, that liability insurance would protect your business and anyone else, Whole Foods or anybody else involved in the distribution from claims relating to foodborne illness or uh, packing mishaps. It's something, some sort of foreign item got into the product. 
some additional considerations that you might have whenever you're selecting a commercial kitchen is what is the licensing history of the facility? Is this a good facility? Have they been shut down in the past for unsanitary conditions? Maybe you don't want to work with them. What type of equipment do they have? Do they have the equipment and enough of it for you to cook your particular item? What about the space layout? Is the space going to be efficient for you? Or are you going to be running around like one of those, you know, chopped chefs? Um, you know, is, is it a good layout for you? Do they have enough storage for your items? Um, how difficult it is it to schedule time in the kitchen? Um, and then obviously fees and, and cost are another big consideration. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I just wanted to go over some other types of agricultural products that are less common, but I just wanted to mention those. So if you grow your own produce and you are offering it for sale in an unaltered state, you don't need a license for that. And what I mean by unaltered state, if you're growing lettuces and you just pull the lettuce out of the ground, um, you could sell that head of lettuce. But if you are chopping the lettuce up and putting it in a bag, that's altered and that's not acceptable. Same thing, you know, if you're growing um, peppers, that's fine to, you know, to pick and sell the whole peppers. But if you start chopping them up or using them in some other concoction, that's not acceptable. There's a limited poultry and egg license for people that have property and have their own chickens that, that lay eggs. So there's, there's a, a license there that allows you to sell a certain number of eggs and your poultry um, from your establishment. Then there, uh, you may need an agricultural dealer's license if you purchase and sell produce from other parties, unless you're using cash. Uh, why that is, but if you are buying produce from someone else in bulk and paying with a credit card, you're going to need an agricultural dealer's license. As I mentioned before, you know, farmers markets all have different requirements for their vendors. So if you want to sell at a particular farmers market, you need to find out what their requirements are and comply with those. Um, you may need certain local permits, depending on um, what particular produce you're trying to sell. <clears throat> and then there are specific regulations for livestock and other seafood products. And then that's the end of my presentation. And this last slide, if Mary, you can advance to the next slide. Um, this is our contact information. If you'd like to apply for services in Collier County, you can contact us. I don't know if you can see this number, but it's 239-666-3122. Or you can email our intake staff at G Jean, that's J E A N, so G J E A N at legalaid.org to apply for our free legal assistance through the Small Business um, Legal Resource Project. And if you don't qualify for that particular uh, project, as Mary mentioned in the beginning, we have several other programs that you will be um, considered for. Um, Mary, are you able to see, do we have any questions or in the um, comment section? I'm not seeing any questions, no. Okay. Um, I, go ahead, Mary, I'm sorry. No, um, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you for anyone who is listening and be sure to contact us if you have any questions or if you wish to apply for services, we'd be happy to hear from you.